What can classical music tell us about the creative mind? I'm a composer teaching at Rice University, and I'm excited to explore this question with you today. I'm grateful to have with me four exceptional musicians from Rice who are participating in the Aspen Music Festival, Sam Park and Shelley Brown violins, Wenlong Huang viola, and Kathy Audis cello. As Tricia mentioned, neuroscientist David Eagleman and I are here at the Aspen Ideas Festival to talk about our upcoming book, The Runaway Species. To give you a little background, as we discuss in our book, creativity doesn't emerge out of the thin air. Instead, our brains draw on their storehouses of experiences, knowledge, and cultural legacies to create something new. Everything comes from a lineage. Now, you don't get a patent for faithful reproduction. That's imitation, not innovation. In order to innovate, our brains have to remodel our experiences. We argue that brains do that using three primary tools, bending, breaking, and blending. Bending involves taking a prototype and transforming it in some way, changing its size, material, shape, any of its features or qualities. You take a dune buggy and shrink it to the size of a few molecules to create a nanoscale car. You take a hard-bodied robot and make it squishy. You take flat Euclidean geometry and twist it into three-dimensional folds to create hyperbolic space. Breaking involves taking something apart and making something new out of some or all of the pieces. You take a solid cast and make it modular so you can move your joints while a bone is healing. You take a solid pill and break it into smaller ones to create time-release medication. You take sound waves and filter out the parts the human ear can't hear to create the MP3. Blending involves combining two or more ideas. For instance, you take a, the fluorescent gene from a sea anemone and you splice it into dog DNA to get a glow-in-the-dark puppy. You combine volleyball and soccer to create foot volley, which is played with your feet on a volleyball court. And it's a little early for this, but you mix lager and apple cider to create a cocktail called the snake bite. <laughs> Humans bend, break, and blend everything we can get our hands on. Taken together, these creative tools turn the familiar into the unprecedented, whether we're painting a canvas, building robots, or inventing mixed drinks. In our book, we talk about bending, breaking, and blending across many disciplines. With the quartet's help, I'd like to explore how these tools apply to music. Beethoven will be providing the examples, but what I'm going to say is true of all classical music. So to create his main themes, Beethoven bends, breaks, and blends the music that he knows and loves. Beethoven didn't invent any scales, and he didn't come up with any new notes. Rather, he used the same scales and chords as everyone else in his time and place, refashioning those musical materials into memorable new ideas. And that's already very creative, but he doesn't stop there. In the course of his piece, he'll take it one step further. Right in front of us, he will bend, break, and blend the themes he's made. That's when his creativity is most exposed, where we can all hear it. So for instance, Variation of a theme is an example of bending, the same musical idea presented in a new way. Let's listen to the main theme of a Beethoven slow movement. Now here's an embellished version of the theme. We recognize it's the same melody, but presented in a way we haven't heard before. That's bending. So fragmentation of a theme is an example of breaking. Instead of playing a theme in its entirety, the composer breaks off a piece of it and makes music out of that. 
Let's listen to a complete theme. Now here's a long passage built out of only the first few notes of the theme. Finally, counterpoint, playing two or more themes at the same time, is an example of blending. Here's the main theme of a Beethoven quartet. Now later in the movement, a second theme is introduced. then those two themes are going to be played at the same time. The second theme, with its downward scale, is going to be in the cello. All right, let's listen to Beethoven's musical blend. So Beethoven's music is like a brain scan of the creative mind at work. We get to observe bending, breaking, and blending right in front of us. Now I want to have a look at one of the big drivers of Beethoven's musical creativity and how it connects to the rest of life. Our brains have evolved to be ruthlessly efficient. So when the brain recognizes that a stimulus is repetitive or predictable, it pays less and less attention to it. That's what you're seeing in these brain scans, decreasing brain activity as the same stimulus is repeated. That phenomenon is called repetition suppression. Repetition suppression is a big reason why advertisements are constantly updated even when the products stay the same. Unless it is refreshed, the familiar gradually becomes invisible to us. If you've been married for more than a few years, you've no doubt experienced repetition suppression. Your spouse thinks they already know what you're going to say before you say it, and tunes out. The trouble is, as any marriage counselor will tell you, tuning out is no way to grow a relationship. In order to bond and to maintain those bonds, we can't afford to run on autopilot. The need to combat repetition suppression and hold each other's attention is a big driver of creativity. That deeply human need comes to the fore in a performance art like classical music. Why? Well, if you're a sculptor, you shape a piece of marble or metal, and what you've made will still be there if you look away, leave the room, or think about something else. It's immune to our distraction. But a musical performance isn't like that. It's just vibrating air, a series of sound waves that appear and disappear. What we call music as an art form, with its themes, patterns, and recurrences, doesn't really exist in the outside world. It only exists in our heads. It's like a sculpture that engraves itself upon our memory. Our attention is the chisel that carves that sculpture. If we're distracted or our minds wander, the sculpture will be damaged. No matter how heartfelt or profound the music, it will fall on deaf ears. It's like a dropped cell phone call where you keep talking, but the person is no longer listening. 
The challenge for a composer is to make that 3D printer in our brains carve the music accurately because that's how we'll have the most memorable experience. The question is how to do that, how to hold our attention. All over the world, a lot of great music is cyclic. In a cyclic piece, the music repeats over and over the same way, or nearly so, as in the folk song, Skip to My Lou. So cyclic music is ideal for participatory music making. Its predictability is an invitation for everyone to join in. A cyclic song's periodicity also works well for partying, dancing, shopping, and eating. If you tune out, no harm done, there'll be more chances to hear exactly the same music. But a classical music concert is a very different setting from a group sing-along. The audience is asked to sit silently in the dark and not join in or interrupt. In that setting, composers can't afford for the audiences to tune out. They need them to tune in. Under these circumstances, cyclic music isn't going to work as well. Composers need to give listeners reasons to pay continued attention and reward them for doing so. Because of this, classical music is a virtual encyclopedia of ways to hold attention through sound alone. We're going to have a look at some of the ways that Beethoven bends, breaks, and blends his musical ideas to keep us tuned in. For starters, we're going to listen to a passage of Beethoven as he could have written it if he weren't concerned about repetition suppression. Now, please keep in mind that even bad Beethoven is still pretty good. The music is, <laughs> the music is lively and exciting, but I want you to note that Beethoven is saying the same thing multiple times. There's the risk that those repeated phrases may become overly familiar and your mind may drift off. So now let's listen to what Beethoven actually wrote. So as you heard, Beethoven may be repeating himself, but he doesn't say the same thing the same way twice. Instead, he syncopated the rhythm, added embellishments, and asked the violin to climb higher and higher. In other words, he bends his musical ideas to keep us tuned in. Of course, we can't know what was going on in Beethoven's mind when he was composing, but I think we can make some logical assumptions. It's hard to imagine that he wanted his audiences to buy tickets, get a babysitter, hail the 19th century version of an Uber, and sit in the dark for two hours and not pay attention. If anything, Beethoven was under even more pressure to hold his audience's interest. This was long before LPs and iPods. There was no guarantee that anyone in the hall would hear his piece more than once in their entire lifetime. If his audience tuned out, his music might completely pass them by forever. So Beethoven wants to keep his listeners engaged. And how he does it tells us a lot about the brain. For instance, human short-term memory lasts somewhere between 15 and 30 seconds. There's not much we can do to stretch that. So the human cognitive strategy is to fill it up more densely. That's what happens when we learn. When we're first exposed to something, it's like being able to pack a suitcase with only a few items. But as we become familiar with it, we can pack more and more information into our short-term memory. We can't change the length of our short-term awareness, but we can change how much it holds. We're going to hear this at work in the next Beethoven example. The theme is a Russian folk melody. In the streets of St. Petersburg, it would be performed as a cyclic song with everyone joining in. Placed in a concert setting, 
Beethoven is going to add more and more layers to it, packing more and more music into the suitcase. Near the end, he's even going to blend the theme with itself, which is a little like packing several of the same shirts. Another way to pack our awareness is to accelerate the pacing. This next passage is based on a theme you might remember from the earlier blending example. It starts with the instruments imitating each other, and then Beethoven will pick up the pace by breaking his fragments into shorter and shorter pieces. So one of the reasons we have a brain is to make accurate predictions of the future. We build up an internal model of reality, and as long as what happens in the outside world matches with our internal model, we don't have to pay too much attention. That's why eyewitness testimony can be so unreliable. We don't attend to the habitual very carefully. But surprise catches our attention. It forces us to update our internal model. Nothing wakes us up more than having something unexpected happen. And of course, that applies to music. Once again, we'll start with bad Beethoven. Here's a passage that's already got a few surprises in it, but still goes along pretty much as expected. Now let's listen to what Beethoven actually wrote. You'll hear two surprises. Let me tell you a little bit about the first one. In Western music, we associate the major mode with positive emotions like happiness and triumph. In contrast, we associate the minor mode with negative emotions like anger and sadness. So in classical music, changing the mode is a way of shifting the mood. The first surprise you'll hear will be an unexpected bend of the theme from major to minor. Same theme, but now in a darker mood. Then for the second uh, surprise, listen as Beethoven suddenly breaks off one of the phrases and inserts something unexpected. Here's the Beethoven. So there's a virtuous cycle going on. 
Beethoven has a lot he wants to tell us, so he knows he needs to hold our attention, and that need is spurring his inventiveness. That virtuous cycle lies at the heart of human creativity. Because of the structure of our brains, we're more adept at asking what if and generating alternative realities than any other species, and we're highly social and want to keep each other engaged and impress each other. That combination has turbocharged our imaginations. Making us wait is another way of holding our attention. The neuroscientist Michael Gazzaniga has written about the importance of delayed gratification in human behavior. Our ability to put off rewards helps us maintain our interest and concentration on complex tasks. In music, delayed gratification occurs whenever we're expecting an arrival, a resolution, a resting point, but the composer puts it off. Let's listen to this bad Beethoven in which the music lands on a clear arrival point. Okay, let's listen to what actually happens as Beethoven makes us wait. With a cyclic song, the only way to change the subject is to change the song. But in classical music, the composer can break away from one idea and introduce another. This contrast is another way of holding, us our, uh, holding our attention. You'll hear that in the next example, which begins with an agitated theme that is supplanted by music that is calmer and more lyrical. Now in a classical piece, a main theme may leave the stage for a while. When it comes back, there's the risk that its callback may not be all that exciting. After all, it's the revisiting of something familiar. So if the composer wants you to sit up and take notice, he or she will use a technique I call rhetorical reinforcement. Rhetorical reinforcement is what helps make your birthday feel special. People give you presents. Your Facebook friends send congratulations. You blow out candles and eat cake. A lot of things happen at the same time to show you that the event is significant. It's like putting an exclamation point on our experience. Rhetorical reinforcement gives us confidence in our perceptions. At a baseball game, when a player on the home team hits a home run, think about what happens. The crowd jumps to its feet, the scoreboard lights up, music starts playing, teammates swarm at home plate. You don't have to be a baseball fan to realize something significant has occurred the coordinated response makes it emphatically clear. Something similar to the home team hitting a home run can happen in music. Let's start with this main theme. <laughs> Now that theme is gonna go away for a while, and then Beethoven's gonna bring it back. First, we're gonna to listen to a version that will tread water on one chord until the theme comes back. Bye. 
So in what we just heard, the return of the theme is pretty understated. Now Beethoven is going to hold that same chord just about the same amount of time. But let's listen to how he uses his creativity to rhetorically reinforce the theme's return. So instead of just holding the chord steady, you heard him speed up the rhythm, thicken the texture, raise the volume, and expand the range. That makes us sit up and pay attention. Home run. In this next example, we're going to mix several different attention-grabbing features. In particular, Beethoven is going to surprise us by bringing back music we didn't expect to hear again. The slow movement of the Opus 18 number no. 6 quartet features this theme. Now the next movement is a lively finale which begins like this. Now typically the slow movement would have been left behind. It's over and that music is gone. But listen to what happens later in the finale. Beethoven has blended the slow movement into the finale. Think of how far we are from cyclic music. One movement has interrupted the other. At the end of the movement, Beethoven adds one more surprise. What happened? Beethoven bends the finale theme by playing it very slowly. It's his final tip of the hat to the earlier movement. And once that loose end is tied up, it's off to the races to the music's conclusion. Humans are sometimes referred to as the storytelling animal. But it goes deeper than that. We're the attention-grabbing animal. We have an unending desire to connect with each other. And we do that best when we hold each other's attention. 
combating repetition suppression requires that we push our creativity as far as we can out into the open, because that's how to avoid redundancy and predictability. Inventiveness and attention go hand in hand. Now we're going to listen to a complete movement. But before we do, I want to highlight a few examples of bending, breaking, and blending that we'll hear. Here's the movement's main theme. Now, here's a bent version in which Beethoven thickens the texture and adds accents. Okay, here's the main theme again. Now, Beethoven's going to break the theme several times using different pieces of it. For instance, the next passage is going to use just the first few notes of the theme. Now here's a passage that, that uses a different fragment, this time from the middle of the theme. Kathy will play the theme for us again. And just that last part of the theme will be, become part of this next passage. Now to blending. Here's another passage later in the movement. And here's a blend where the main theme is combined with this new passage. Creative tools of bending, breaking, and blending will be on full display in this movement from Beethoven's String Quartet, Opus 59, number one. Beethoven will spend the first part of the movement introducing his themes, and then most of the rest of it remodeling them in front of our ears. You'll hear him pack his ideas more densely, accelerate the pacing, jolt us with surprises, and make us wait. There's so much inventiveness going on that the piece has only a handful of identical measures. I hope you'll enjoy it.
So when people talk about classical music, themes tend to get most of the press. But themes are only part of the story. It's what the composers do with them that makes this repertoire such a great model of creative thinking. Beethoven's music is alive with inventiveness. Right in front of us, he bends, breaks, and blends his themes. We get to hear that remodeling. Creativity is often defined as something that is novel and useful. But that doesn't quite capture the tension between familiarity and novelty that is part of all creative work. Too familiar and we're bored. Too novel and we're confused. The hard part is finding the sweet spot in the middle. In the movement we just heard, Beethoven invigorates the familiar by constantly modifying it and carefully links his new ideas to what has come before. That's what makes his music seem to flow and helps us to follow it. That tempering of the new with the familiar lies at the heart of all human creativity. We all have a bit of Beethoven in us. In our daily lives, we bend, break, and blend what we say and do to engage others and keep ourselves alert. Beethoven's music is a distilled version of all of that. That's one of the reasons that we feel we gain wisdom or insight from listening to it. It helps us understand ourselves and how we relate to the world. Think about it. Beethoven is just moving air around. Yet the fate of those air molecules is so absorbing that we'll listen to his music as if our lives depended on it. Because, in a sense, they do. The same features of a musical experience that grab our attention. Surprise, contrast, rhetorical reinforcement, delayed gratification help us to navigate our lives. At a classical concert, how music goes about holding our attention is part of the story it's telling. And through that, the music chisels itself into our thoughts. Thank you to the quartet and to all of you. Thank you. <laughs>